Thush Chisan Kanawe Masaiga. Taught George Chakwa, and today we're going to be reading chapters 9 and 10 out of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But before we get going with that, let's go ahead and take care of our housekeeping. Make sure you like and subscribe and subscribe and then like and then like and subscribe again. Today's George Jake of the Day is brought to you by George. He was kind of like a sad potato. But I did do it on the back of an envelope because I'm running low on paper. So don't forget, if you want to do your Jake of the Day on scratch paper, that's fine. Also, if you want to do it on some kind of art thing on your tablet, you can send that file to me with your parents' permission. Before we get started, let's talk about some resources in the community. The food pantry phone number is 503-879-FOOD. And the support line for other kinds of help is 503-879-HELP. <clears throat> Today's uh, vocabulary is Seder, Centaur, Sluice Gate, and Frousty. A couple of those words I didn't know what they meant, so I picked them. Anyway, without further ado, let's get some coffee in my gullet and we'll start reading chapter 9 and 10. I did get to go into the parade yesterday, and I saw quite a few of our uh, families out and about through Willamina and Grand Ronde. It was good seeing and yelling at all you guys. Something I certainly miss. Without further ado, Chapter 9, In the Witch's House. And now, of course, you want to know what had happened to Edmund. He had eaten his share of the dinner, but he had really enjoyed it because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. Don't forget Turkish Delights, that kind of like gummy candy. But this one's magical. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation, and he hadn't enjoyed it much either, because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver told them about Aslan. And until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table, it was then that he had began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door. For the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, just as it gave the others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle. And just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them all that the white witch wasn't really human at all, but a half gin and a half giantess, Edmund had got outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brothers and sisters to be turned to stone. He did want Turkish delight and to be a prince and later a king and to pay Peter for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do with the others, he didn't want her to be particularly nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself, but he managed to believe, or to pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them. Because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me anyway, much nicer than they are, I expect she is the rightful queen, really. Anyway, she'll be better than that awful Aslan. At least that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside him, he really knew that the White Witch was bad and cruel. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling all around him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house. And, of course, there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone, for it had been uh, nearly three o'clock when they sat down to dinner, and the winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it, so he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam. Luckily, it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen. To the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute. And what with that and the snowflakes swirling all around him, he could hardly see three feet in f ahead. That's closer than social distancing. And then, too, there was no 
road. He kept sl slipping into deep drifts of snow and skidding on frozen puddles and tripping over fallen tree trunks and sliding down steep banks and barking his shins against rocks till he was wet and cold and bruised all over. The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others, if he hadn't happened to say to himself, When I'm king of Narnia, the first thing I shall do will be to make some decent roads. And of course, that set him off thinking about being a king and all the other things he would do, and this cheered him up a good deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have and how many cars and all about his private cinema, that's a movie theater, and where the principal railways would run and what laws he would make against beavers and dams and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter in his place when the weather changed. First, the snow stopped. Then a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled away and the moon came out. It was a full moon and shining on all that snow. It made everything almost as bright as day, only the shadows were rather confusing. He would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out by the time he got to the other river. You remember he had seen, when they first arrived at the beavers, a smaller river flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up. But the little valley down which it came was much steeper and rockier than the one he had just left, and much overgrown with bushes, so that he could not have managed it at all in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through, for he had to stoop under branches, and great loads of snow came sliding off into his back. That's a bad feeling. And every time this happened, he thought more and more. He hated Peter! just as if all this had been Peter's fault. But at last he came to a part where it was more level and the valley opened up and there on the other side of the river, quite close to him in the middle of the little plain between two hills, he saw what must be the white witch's house and the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers, little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp needles. They looked like huge dunces caps or sorcerers caps and they shone in the moonlight and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house but it was too late to think of turning back now. He crossed the river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring, not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deeply newly fallen snow. He walked on and on past corner after corner of the house and past turret after turret to find the door. He had to go right round to the far side before he found it. It was a huge arch, but the great iron gates stood wide open. Here's a quick picture of it. A quick drink of my coffee. Edmund crept up to the arch and looked inside to the courtyard. And there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion, crouched as if it were ready to spring. And Edmund stood in the shadow of the arch, afraid to go on and afraid to go back, with his knees knocking together. He stood there so long that his teeth would have been chattering with cold, even if they had not been chattering with fear. How long this really lasted, I don't know, but it seemed to Edmund to last four hours. Then at last he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing that it couldn't have been looking at him at all, but supposing it turns its head, thought Edmund. In fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it about four feet away. Ah! thought Edmund. When it springs at the dwarf, that will be my chance to escape. But still, the lion never moved, nor did the dwarf. And now at last, Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion. And as soon as he had that, th that thought of that, he noticed that the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow.
Of course it must only be a statue. No living animal would let itself get covered with snow. Then very slowly, and his heart beating as if it would burst, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now, he hardly dared to touch it. But at last, he put out his hand very quickly and did. It was cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over, right down to his toes. And at the same time, there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan they were all talking about. He, she's caught him already and turned him into stone. So that's the end of their fine ideas about him. Pfft, who's afraid of Aslan? And he stood there gloating over the stone lion, and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip, and then a pair of spectacles on its eyes. Ooh, that was a word from the other day, spectacles or glasses. Then he said, ah, silly old Aslan, how do you like being stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it, the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad and noble, staring up at the moonlight, that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of jeering at it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. <clears throat> As he got into the middle of it, he saw that there were dozens of statues all about, standing here and there, rather as the pieces stand on a chessboard when it's halfway through the game. Then there were stone satyrs, and stone wolves, and bears, and foxes, and cat a mountains of stone. There were lovely stone shapes that looked like women, but who were really the spirits of trees. There was the great shape of a centaur, and a winged horse, and a long lithe creature that Edmund took to be a dragon. They all looked so strange standing there, perfectly lifelike, and also perfectly still, in the bright cold moonlight, that it was eerie work crossing the courtyard. Right in the very middle stood a huge shape like a man, but as tall as a tree, with a fierce face and a shaggy beard and a great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant and not a live one, Edmund did not like going past it. He now saw that there was a dim light showing from a doorway on the far side of the courtyard. He went to it, and there was a flight of stone steps going up to an open door. Edmund went up to them. Across the threshold lay a great wolf. It's all right, it's all right, he kept saying to himself. It's only a stone wolf. It can't hurt me. And he raised his leg to step over it. Instantly, the huge creature rose, with all the hair bristling along its back, opened a great red mouth, and said in a growling voice, which is going to hurt my voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. If you please, sir, said Ed Edmund, trembling so that he could hardly speak. My, my, my name's Edmund, and I'm a son of Adam, and her majesty said the other in the wood the other day, it, I've come to bring her the news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia, quite close in the beaver's house. She, she, uh, she wanted to see them. I will tell her majesty, said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand still on the threshold as you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood and waited, his fingers aching with cold and his heart pounding in his chest. And presently the gray wolf, Malgram, the chief of the witch's secret police came bounding back and said, Come in, come in, fortunate favorite of the queen, or else not so fortunate. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long, gloomy hall with many pillars full, as the courtyard had been, of statues. The one nearest the door was a little fawn, with a very sad expression on its face, and Edmund couldn't help wondering if this might be Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close beside this sat the white witch. I'm, co I'm come, your majesty, said Edmund, rushing forward. I forget how the queen sounded. How dare you come alone? Oh, that sounded not like it. How dare you come alone? Said the witch in a terrible voice. Did I not tell you to bring the others with you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund. I've done the best I can. I brought them quite close. They're in a little house on top of the dam just up the river with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. 
A slow, cruel smile came over the witch's face. Is this all your news? she asked. No, no, your majesty, said Edmund, and proceeded to tell her all he had heard before leaving the house. What? Aslan? cried the queen. Aslan, is this true? If I find you have lied to me. Please, please, I'm only repeating what they said, stammered Edmund. But the queen, who was no longer attending to him, clapped her hands. Instantly, the same dwarf whom Edmund had seen with her before appeared. Make ready our sledge, ordered the witch, and use the harnesses without bells. It's the end of chapter nine. Start a me drinking coffee. <sighs> chapter ten. The spell begins to break. Now we must go back to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver and the three other children. As soon as Mr. Beaver said, There's no time to lose! Everyone began bundling themselves into coats, except Mrs. Beaver, who started picking up sacks and laying them on the table, and said, Now, Mr. Beaver, just reach down the ham and there's a packet of tea. There's sugar, some matches, and if someone will get two or three loaves out of the crock over there in the corner. What are you doing, Mrs. Beaver? exclaimed Susan. Well, packing a load of it for each of us, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver very coolly. You didn't think we'd set out on a journey with nothing to eat, did you? But we haven't time, said Susan, buttoning the collar of her coat. She may be here any moment. That's, that's why I say, chimed in Mr. Beaver. Well, get along with you all, said his wife. Think it over, Mr. Beaver. There can't be here for a quarter of an hour at least. But don't we want as big a start as we can possibly get, said Peter, if we're to reach the stone table before her? You've got to remember that, Mrs. Beaver, said Susan. As soon as she looked in here and finds we're gone, she'll be off at top speed. Oh, that she will, said Mrs. Beaver. But we can't get there before whatever we do, for she'll be on a sledge and we'll be walking. Then we have no hope, said Susan. Now, now, don't you get fussing there, a dear, said Mrs. Beaver. But just get a half a dozen clean handkerchiefs out of the drawer, cause we've got a hope. We can't get there before her, but we can keep under cover and go by way she won't expect, and perhaps we'll get through. That's true enough, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband. But it's time you were out of here, and we were out of here. And don't you start fussing either, Mr. Beaver, said his wife. There, that's better. There's five loads, and the smallest for the smallest of us. That's you, my dear, she said, looking at Lucy. Oh, oh, do, please come on, said Lucy. Well, I'm not nearly ready now, answered Mrs. Beaver at last, allowing her husband to help her into her snow boots. I suppose the sewing machine's too heavy to bring. Yes, it is, said Mr. Beaver. A great deal too heavy, and you don't think you'll be able to use it while we're on the run, I suppose. I can't abide the thought of that witch fiddling with it, said Mrs. Beaver, and breaking it or stealing it as likely as not. Oh, please, please do hurry, said the three children. And so at last they all got outside, and Mr. Beaver... Lock the door. It'll be later a bit, he said, and they set off, all carrying their loads over their shoulders. The snow had stopped and the moon had come out when they began their journey. They went in single file, first Mr. Beaver, then Lucy, then Peter, then Susan, and Mrs. Beaver. Last of all, Mr. Beaver led them across the dam and on to the right bank of the river, and then along a very rough sort of path among the trees, right down by the river bank. The sides of the valley, shining in the moonlight, towered up far above them on either hand. Best keep down here as much as possible, he said. She'll have to keep to the top, for you couldn't break a sledge down here. It would have been a pretty rough scene to look at it through a window from a comfortable armchair, and even as things were, Lucy enjoyed it at first. But as they went on walking and walking and walking, and as the sack she was carrying felt heavier and heavier and heavier, she began to wonder how she was going to keep up at all, and she stopped looking at the dazzling brightness of the frozen river with all of its waterfalls of ice and at the white masses of the treetops and the great glaring moon and the countless stars and could only watch the little short legs of Mr. Beaver going pad, 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 pad through the snow in front of her as if they were never going to stop. Then the moon disappeared and the snow began to fall once more, and at last Lucy was so tired that she was almost asleep and walking at the same time, when suddenly she found that Mr. Beaver had turned away from the river bank to the right, and was leading them steeply uphill into the very thickest of bushes. 
And then, as she came fully awake, she found that Mr. Beaver was just vanishing into a little hole in the bank, which had almost been hidden under the bushes until you were quite on top of it. In fact, by the time she realized what was happening, only a short, flat tail was showing. Lucy immediately stooped down and crawled in after him. When she heard noises of scrambling and puffing and panting behind her, and in a moment, all five of them were inside. Wherever is this? said Peter's voice, sounding tired and pale in the darkness. I hope you know what I mean by a voice sounding pale. It's an old hiding place for beavers in bad times, said Mr. Beaver, and a great secret. It's not much of a place, but we must get a few hours sleep. If you had been all, if you hadn't all been in such a plaguey fuss when we were starting, I would have brought some pillows, said Mrs. Beaver. It wasn't nearly such a nice cave as Mr. Tumnus's. Lucy thought. Just a hole in the ground, but dry and earthy. It was very small, so that when they all lay down together, they were all a bundle of clothes together. And what with that and being warmed up by their long walk, they were really rather snug. If only the floor of the cave had been a little smoother. Then Mrs. Beaver handed round in the dark, handed round in the dark a little flask out of which everyone drank something. It made one cough and splutter a little, and stung the throat, but it also made you feel deliciously warm after you'd swallowed it, and everyone went straight to sleep. It seemed to Lucy only the next minute, though really it had been hours and hours later, when she woke up feeling a little cold and dreadfully stiff and thinking the house she would like a hot bath. Then she felt a long set of whiskers tickling her cheek and saw the cold daylight coming in through the mouth of the cave. But immediately after that, she was very wide awake indeed, and so was everyone else. In fact, they were all sitting up with their mouths and eyes wide open, listening to a sound, which was the very sound they'd all been thinking of, and sometimes imagining they heard. During their last walk, last night, it was the sound of jingling bells. Mr. Beaver was out of the cave like a flash the moment he heard it. Perhaps you think as Lucy thought for a moment, that it was a very silly thing to do. But it was really a very sensible one. He knew he could scramble to the top of the bank among bushes and brambles without being seen, and he wanted above all things to see which way the witch's sledge went. The others all sat in the cave, waiting and wondering. They waited nearly five minutes. Then they heard something that frightened them very much indeed. They heard voices. Oh, thought Lucy, he's been seen. She's caught him. Great was their surprise when a little later they heard Mr. Be <laughs> Mr. Beaver's voice calling to them from just outside the cave. It's all right, he shouted. Come out, Mrs. Beaver, come out. Sons and daughters of Adam, it's all right, it isn't, eh? Huh? This was bad grammar, of course, but that is how beavers talk when they are excited. I mean, in Narnia, in our world, they don't usually talk at all. So Mrs. Beaver and the children came bundling out of the cave, all blinking in the daylight and with earth all over them, and looking very frousty, and unbrushed, and uncombed, and with a deep sleep in their eyes. Come on, cried Mr. Beaver, who was almost dancing with delight. Come and see! This is a nasty knock for the witch! It looks as if her power's already crumbling! What do you mean, Mr. Beaver? panted Peter as they scrambled up the steep bank of the hill. Didn't I tell you, answered Mr. Beaver, that she, she made it always winter and never Christmas! Didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. And then they were all on top and did see. It was a sledge. And it was reindeer with bells on their harnesses. But they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer. And they were not white, but brown. And on the sledge sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood that had fur inside and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him because, though you see people of his sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on the side of the wardrobe, on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it is rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly, but now that the children stood looking at him. They didn't find it quite like that. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. 
Oh, I've come at last, said he. She has kept me out for a long time, but I've got in at last. Aslan is on the move. The witcher's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness, which you only get if you are being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presents. There's a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs. Beaver. I will drop it off in your home as I pass. Oh, if you please, sir, said Mrs. Beaver, making a curtsy. It's locked up. <laughs> Locks and bolts make no difference to me, said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr. Beaver, when you get home, you will find that your dam is finished and mended, and all the leaks stopped, and a new sluice gate fitted. Mr. Beaver was so pleased that he opened his mouth very wide, and then found he couldn't say anything. Oh, <laughs> Peter, Adam's son, said Father Christmas. Here, sir, said Peter. These are your presents, was the answer, and they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color of silver, and across it there was ramped a red lion, as bright as a ripe strawberry. At the moment when you picked it, the hilt of the sword was gold, and it had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed, and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. Oh, now, Susan, Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas, these are for you. And he handed her a bow and a quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. You must only use the bow in great need, he said. For I do not mean for you to fight in the battle. It does not easily miss. And when you put this horn to your lips and blow it, then wherever you are, I think some kind of help will come to you. Last of all, he said, Oh, Lucy's Eve's daughter. And Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle of what looked like glass. But people said afterward that it was made of diamond and a small dagger. In this bottle, he said, there is a cordial made of the juice of one of the fire flowers that grow on the mountains in the sun. If you or any of your friends is hurt, a few drops of this will restore them. And the dagger is to defend yourself at great need, for you are also not to be in the battle. Why, sir, said Lucy, I, I, I think I don't know, but I, I think I could be brave enough. <laughs> that is not the point, he said, but battles are ugly when women fight. And now, here he suddenly looked less grave, here is something for the moment for you all. And he brought out, I suppose from the big bag at his back, but nobody quite saw him do it, a large tray containing five cups and saucers, a bowl of lump sugar, a jug of cream, and a great big teapot, all sizzling and piping hot. Then he cried out, Merry Christmas! Long live the true king! and cracked his whip, and he and the reindeer and the sledge and all were out of sight before anyone realized that they had started. Peter had just drawn his sword out of its sheath and was showing it to Mr. Beaver when Mrs. Beaver said, No, now then, now then, don't stand talking there till the tea's got cold, just like men. Come and help to carry the tray down and we'll have breakfast. What a mercy I thought of bringing the bread knife. So down the steep bank they went and back to the cave and Mr. Beaver cut some of the bread and ham into sandwiches, and Mrs. Beaver poured out the tea, and everyone enjoyed themselves. But long before they had finished enjoying themselves, Mr. Beaver said, Time to be time to be moving on now. Covet Kagwa Ugu chapter. That's the end of the chapter. All right, guys, that's all the reading for today. Remember to check out our Brock Lobster Math of the Day, of which only a fifth grader seems to be able to get any of the answers. Good job, fifth grader. You know who you are. Um, other than that, uh, Hayumasi Puschagu, uh, Afki Pusalda, and remember you can reach me at my email address or just in the Google Classroom. Alright, Afki!